My notebook is slick in my shaking hands as I open it. Flipping to the back. Dampening the blue lined pages along the way. I shakingly uncap my favorite ballpoint pen. The expensive one Harry got me after I wrote my hundredth story. Tradition in the crime department. Get a grip, Jake. Get a grip. Get a grip. But I just can't seem to recover from whatever the hell happened a minute ago. Seriously. What was that? Probably just nerves. Al psyched me out with his ominous warning. Or maybe I had a panic attack. I'm not big on small spaces. Yeah, that must be it. Just a stupid panic attack. God, you're such a pussy. I exhale, counting down from five in my head. Okay, Solomon, I say. Let's hear it. The kid smiles for a long minute. A weird, wide smile. And red across his pale little cheeks. Could be cute. If it wasn't so fucking bizarre. Suddenly I'm overcome with a flashback. A clown. A giant clown. Maybe 6'5". I encountered him when I was young, around Solomon's age. I was at a circus in my tiny hometown of Broken Bow, roughly 250 miles southeast of Oklahoma City. The painted red grin twisted on his huge face. I remember he bent down to look at me when my mom was buying popcorn. I have a surprise for you, he whispered his black eyes glittering, making me sick, so sick. Come see me after the show, kid. I can feel the tie I had for lunch coming up. I killed those people. Solomon says, stopping the Tom Young in its tracks, but sending a lasting chill down my arms, my torso, my legs. I clench my jaw. Dear God, what is my problem? As Solomon smiles again, noticing my discomfort. What's wrong, Jake? He looks me directly in the eyes now. Those crystal blue irises, so unlike anything I have ever seen. Something about them makes me feel like I can't look away. The noise starts up again. The buzzing the perpetual buzzing. I jerk my head down. This kid must be a hypnotist or something. A creepy, fucked up hypnotist. Nothing, I say. Examining my notebook, pretending to jot something down. You're fine, Jake. You're fine. Go on. Silence now. Slowly. Ever so slowly, I lift my gaze. The kid, like earlier, looks like he's seeing something. Something that's not there. His eyes are transfixed on the wall next to where I'm standing, and I can practically feel the heat of his stare on the cement. Yes, I killed those people, he says, still engrossed. They were very bad people. Why were they bad, Solomon? I say as gently as I can in my best prodding reporter voice. Although I'm freaked out, some sense of professionalism remains. What do they do to you? The kid slides to the ground now, his back against the far wall. He leans forward and scratches his fingernails on the paved floor. His nails leave white, chalky marks back and forth. Solomon scrapes and scrapes. I grip my teeth at the sound. They told me I'm their worst nightmare. 
he says, with the simplicity of a kindergartner. They told me they wished I were dead. I sit down on the ground, across from him, cross-legged. It's important to be level with those you're interviewing, or you can seem intimidating and unfriendly. Not that it would matter with this psycho. Why did they wish you were dead? Solomon gazes at me now. I realize with dawning horror that I can no longer see the blue of his irises. This time, the buzzing in my ears is sharp, piercing, like that of a thousand sirens during mass tragedy. Loud, so loud, my vision is shaking. Because, Jake, they knew that I am the devil. The sirens are screaming now, bursting my eardrums. I see a double of Salmon, two pale faces, irisless eyes, two bald heads, and red mouths. I cannot think. I can't breathe. I'm choking on the sounds. Solomon laughs. <laughs> and the sirens cease abruptly. I'm heaving hard, gasping. My lungs feel like they can't get enough air. But I'm trying, trying so hard. Breathe in, breathe out. Easy now. Easy. I'm not a spiritual man. Mom was a Catholic. Dad had no faith. I always took after Dad. Choosing to believe science over what I thought was Bronze Age fiction. A fabrication designed to add cushion to death. Wrongdoings. Human evil. Just one big lie. Because we can't handle the truth. But what is the truth? Solomon is the devil? The statement rings clear in my head, like it was obvious all along. Like I was the fool for not knowing it from the start. I push the thought aside, no matter what is happening in this cell, no matter what kind of evil dwells here, I must write Solomon's narrative. Now, more than ever, I am scared shitless. My instincts are telling me to bail on this piece, to run back to my apartment, and try to forget the entire interview. Although I know it will be plaguing my dreams for years to come. But I can't. It's my duty to tell this story. Go on, Salman, I say. Talk to me more about that. Solomon giggles. <laughs> and the sound mingles eerily with the screeching of his nails on the pavement. There's nothing to tell. You know it's the truth. I write this down word for word. I cannot miss a single thing he says. There's so much at stake. Why don't you explain to me how you killed the Davis family? Solomon finally stops scraping, but instead claps his hands gleefully. With a butter knife. First, I did Margot, then Philip, and I saved Jesse for last. His joyful tone makes me nauseous, and I feel the Thai food sloshing around in my stomach again. Margot was the wife, 41, a sales rep. Philip, the husband, 45, an accountant. And Jesse, the son, was 15, the cross star, honor student, Perfectly nice, white picket fence family. Loved by all who knew them. That had to be pretty difficult with your size. My voice trails off, shit. What a stupid thing to say. Solomon grows quiet. Menacing. You know that doesn't matter, Jake. I don't want to ask any more questions. I want to tell Harry off. Maybe even transfer departments. I want to mourn the Davis family, but I keep pushing. 
Why doesn't it matter? Because I can do anything. I write it down, dumbfounded. I don't, for the love of God, know what to believe anymore. How did you know the Davises? Solomon taps his chin, looking up at the ceiling, toying with me now. This interview is just sick amusement for him. Jesse used to babysit me, but I didn't like him very much. He begins humming, soft and dark. A frantic tune, a familiar one. I can't quite seem to pinpoint it. Why not? He hums louder now, pauses only to answer my question. Because he didn't like the games I played. With this I realize I've had enough for one day. Hell, for one lifetime. In my three years interviewing criminals, murderers, rapists, arsonists, gang leaders, I've never felt this way before. A vile cold grips my bones. My head is swimming in blood red fear. I leave this cell, nodding briefly at Al, breezing past. I'm too shaken to plan a night at the bar right now, or talk about what happened. I walk down the long gray corridor to the exit sign, out into the light. I cross the parking lot and start my car. I pull out of the parking lot and onto the road, thinking about the story I'm going to write. What will everyone think? I've decided I'm going to paint a detailed picture, just as I experienced in the cell today. Will they think it's all bullshit? Will they believe me? One thing's for sure, the fear I felt with that psycho was real. I stop at a four-way intersection, turn on the radio, and fiddle with the stations. Then and only then do I remember the song Solomon was humming. Barnum and Bailey's favorite, from the Broken Bow Circus.